So I'm going to start off by introducing one of my colleagues. Uh, the orange octopus on the screen is our like sort of project's unofficial mascot for maybe about five years ago, like five years now. Um, before that, our app logo was like a, a, a bit of clip art we'd taken off Google Images. And once we started getting users, especially people who were not part of our little group, we thought we should probably replace that stolen artwork with, you know, like an actual logo. Um, mm. So when I speak to people about what I do, a lot of people are quite interested in the environment in which we work, our particular niche in oceanography. Um, so I thought I would sort of try and split this talk into two things. The first thing is like the context um, around our project and um, the history of it. And then sort of more relevant to being an RSC in general, uh, some of the lessons that we've learned throughout the progression of this project or things that I've learned starting off um, sort of eight years ago till till now. So I'll start off with introducing myself. Um, I would say that I am an RSE, although I've never had that as a title. I've always been a software engineer working within research environments, quite generalist, um, computer science background. Um, as an undergrad, I worked in Plymouth Marine Lab and Newport Robotics Lab. And then I started in the NOC almost eight years ago now, um, 7.9 years. Um, and my job title at NOC, I think still is Mars Gliders Engineer, which has does not have software in it at all. Um, and I've been on secondment to the project that I've been working on for the whole time um, from this group of people who actually maintain the physical robots that we put in the water. Um, but when I was hired, it was I was basically an embedded RSE, um, and now I'm part of this this big group of people that are working on essentially like an operational product. Um, I didn't know anything about oceanography before I joined NOC. I still don't, but now I know how how much I don't know. Um, and everything I have learned about um, you know project management, etc., I've picked up on the job because we've had to. Um, so where I am is essentially, we're kind of, I would say our division of the NOC is, um, academia adjacent. We exist to support the scientists. Um, so national marine facilities have a big pool of engineers, technicians, uh, developers who, and a big pool of equipment. We have two research ships, um, and everything that goes on them and a bunch of robotic systems. And um, we kind of operate those as a service for uh, the broader scientific community. Um, so when people get uh, grant money and stuff that goes into uh, expeditions that we operate. Um, and then within, within that, we have uh, software development groups. Um, and inside of that is my team. Uh, the command and control project, uh, which I refer to as the C2. Um, so firstly, what are autonomous underwater vehicles or AUVs, which is what I work with? Um, I'm going to focus on the two main ones that we're using um, in M NMF. Uh, the one we have the most of is underwater gliders. Um, and these are commercial off-the-shelf products that we buy from so two manufacturers. Um, you could consider them, so you could draw parallels with these and um, sort of extraterrestrial rovers in that most of the time they're operating, you don't really have um, a sort of communication with them. You have communications windows uh, because they have to sort of send data back over satellites because once you're underneath the ocean surface, you have no communication with them. Um, yeah, they're sort of battery powered. You have to think about um, how you manage power. Um, they have modular science payloads, so uh, payload bays, so we can put various different kinds of sensors. Um, and 
also we are developing in-house a bigger platform and this is being actively developed within the NOC and that's the auto subs so the um the bigger things you can see being like craned off of ships um towards the bottom of this slide those are the auto subs um they are the auto sub long ranges are also the platform which was bestowed with the boat team at boat face name as a compromise when the NERC name like you know public vote for uh, the RS uh, David Attenborough well you know <laughs> um that was the compromise ALR became Boaty. um so why we use these um our sort of grand vision is that we use them in place of what we're doing with ships a lot more um greatly increase the amount we're using autonomous systems in the ocean to collect data um, over, you know, sort of months at a time um, so that we have to rely on ships less because ships have a lot of crew on them. Um, you know, they burn through a lot of fuel. They're very expensive. Um, and we can put a whole bunch more AVs out to kind of collect similar data um, with much less impact. Um, but in order to get there, we have to do lots of work on making them all, uh, you know, interoperable um, and reliable and require a lot less effort to operate. So the C2 is the tool we're developing to help with that. So um, the gliders, because they're commercial off the shelf products, they have their own software. Um, the two types that we have have different software. And then the auto subs that we're developing in house, they're being developed in parallel. So the C2 is their software. But yeah, we have these, these different platforms, all of which are operated differently and um, have different requirements on how you, you know, sort of run the software and they require different training. So we have this system that sits on top of those, um, collects all the data, um, you know, puts it into like a normalized format and then presents it on an interface which is standard for all of them so that um, there's a lot less workload required on the people who actually operate these. And also when it comes to getting the data off them, we want the scientists to have less barriers to that data. You know, they, they sort of have to let, understand less about the nuances of the platforms themselves. Um, the C2 is like a system which started off as what we call like over the horizon. So over the horizon means we're communicating with the AUVs uh, via satellite connection. Uh, so someone will be sat back on land in an office um, uh, looking at the data that's coming back and then sort of queuing commands to send to the AUVs. Um, a few years back, our requirements shifted greatly um because we were doing work with AUVs under ice sheets and under ice you can't rely on satellite communication because how do you get a clear view of the sky if you're under an ice sheet um so there was work um with sort of communication via acoustics or like local communication stuff and that meant having a system that we put on our ships and the ships are quite constrained in the um, internet connections they have. Um, the sort of further you go south or north, you know, polar regions, you know, like the, the less and less likely it is that you're going to have an internet connection. So this system that started off as like this um, very web-based system that you could access as long as you had internet, we had to figure out how to, you know, um, contain that um, in a place that didn't have internet and also be doing real-time com communication over these new channels. And at that point, we called that C2 in a box. Um, so before the C2, that like when I started, my first sort of year and a half was, um, there was sort of a, a vague plan. Uh, when I started, it was, okay, here's the existing tools we've got for gliders. What can you do to make them better? We didn't, I didn't sort of particularly have um, 
a a big project to be working on. Um, it was sort of just exploratory stuff, and out of that came the, the sort of Mark One of the Mars portal, which is this site here, which was like a, a view only um, website for both the people that were using our, our AUVs at NOC and also the scientists, um, so that people could see where they were and get some context, like sort of uh, satellite imagery and also the, the scientific data plots. Um, because before that, there were people just writing lots of little bespoke tools by themselves. You know, scientists would have various MATLAB scripts or like, you know, people would be throwing around Google Earth um, files. Then from 26 onwards, 2016 onwards, we got funding, five years of funding to begin with uh, to create the sort of the evolution of that. Uh, and the aim was to, it was no longer like a read only thing. We wanted to be able to operate our AUVs from this. Um, so like this slide is um, someone doing like a, a plan, planning a mission for all, one of our auto subs. And then today we're looking again at um, how we make our data more, well, more findable and more accessible for um, the broader community again. So the public can see where we're operating, um, you know, what campaigns have been running. Um, and then, you know, the idea is eventually we link to the, the data from those campaigns that's being stored at the British Oceanograph Oceanographic Data Center. Um, so the team to date started off just me and my line manager in 2015. Now we've grown to eight and next month we'll have hired two more. Um, Pretty much all of us are general software developers. We have one research software engineer by title now. Um, and most of us don't have an oceanographic background, but we do have backgrounds in, um, you know, a, sort of a diverse range. Um, we are all working on this one product full time. Um, none of us kind of sort of, when we're thinking about sort of how what kind of shape of of group we are uh, in the sort of terms of RSE groups? Um, yeah, we're, we're we're very much like um, one group focused on one thing. Um, any sort of side work that we get funding for will feed into that. Um, so the next few slides they've got quite broad statements, um, and this was sort of if I was. If we were sort of beginning the project from scratch, um, what lessons would our future selves want to kind of <laughs> relay to, you know, sort of us at the beginning? Um, and so they're quite broad statements. But statement number one, yeah, whatever you do, even if there's just one of you working on something, have processes. Um, and I'm not going to like go into loads of detail about like how we run our sort of now agile project or the the sort of the tools we use like so GitLab issues and stuff. But it was sort of a hard lesson that we learned a few years in, um, because when it was just me, my line manager, um, I was the one doing most of the development work. I wasn't focused on that. I was sort of just exploring things. I knew enough that I should be putting stuff into Git repos and making it sort of shareable, adding a bit of documentation. Um, but as we've grown, like we've had to think lots and lots about how we introduce all these sort of project management things on top. Um, and a lot of the time, I think it was sort of a little bit too late. So sort if of we were doing it out of necessity. Um, so it's, so I think, yeah, like when, when there's like a, a big, well, when there's a project that's sort of starting up and you've got um, a longer period of time to be working on it, um, yeah, like just think how it's organized. Um, then something else that we can do because we're not like a, a general pool of people um, is we can always get at least two of us working on things. Um, this is really beneficial because it means that none of us become like a singular subject matter expert um, because what we're doing is very multidisciplinary. Uh, we're not just writing web APIs to interact with these AUVs. We have to sort of get an understanding of how the scientific sensors work or how the vehicles operate and then a whole bunch of infrastructure stuff 
um, how does the networking on the ships work or um, how do the satellites constellations work? Um, so th there's like a big learning curve. Um, so it's very useful to have, you know, at least two of us sharing the workload for each of that um, making sure that someone's always reviewing your code, um, sort of hard rule on that and also switching up the roles. So we've sort of switched between who's running the sprints, uh, who's sort of becoming user support, um, and then who's sort of focusing on deep work in the background versus who's sort of focused on um, keeping the system up, which is getting more and more important as we're getting used um, sort of in production more and more. Um, and then I think sort of most people appreciate this in a research environment, it's, um, the more you learn about something, the more you realize you don't know much about it. So it's sort of um, being suspicious when tools just seem to work um, and sort of looking deeper into like, you know, sort of shiny new toolkit or like, um, I. but I think the thing I wanted to highlight the most in this slide was like the making introductions thing. Um, we work in a building with lots of siloing, sort of, it just happens where the division of like that we're in all kind of engineering focused can be a bit removed from the scientists sometimes. And there's also a lot of RSE type people embedded in those scientific groups on the other side of the building. And we do find sometimes that we're working on the same things. Um, and it's sort of purely because we didn't know that those other groups existed. Um, so it's sort of it's an unsolved problem and I think it's an, like it's not exclusive to us but um finding ways in which to just sort of make sure like when new people start um find ways to sort of introduce them to all of the different groups and sort of making them aware of like who knows what enough that they at least know like who to go ask for things um and yeah, like the <laughs> the Slack conversation we had, yeah, like a, a dolphin on some trials messing with one of the auto subs. And I think before they realized what was happening, there was lots of pouring over it. It's like, oh, why is the, why is it broken? Like, what's what, why is all this data coming out weird? And it's just like, oh yeah, of course. Like marine mammal, like so. Sort of, um and then finally, big overwhelming slide. Um I think working on research ships is quite an interesting environment. Um, you can be quite constrained sometimes because it's quite difficult to like Google for things when you're like in the middle of like the Atlantic or the Pacific. Um, sort of all all the, the the stuff you brought on with you, you, you can't pop off to like a, a shop or like a library or anything um, for at least you know three weeks, six weeks maybe, um, and you're quite it's quite engaging you like um you know you, you want to help the research happening in like real time people are trying to collect data they're sort of dealing with um you know adverse conditions like suddenly the weather can change oh we need to change our schedule like um to beat um you know a storm or something we need to collect this bit of data um and you end up becoming like a sort of jack of many trades um which i think i, I really enjoy as like someone who you know, the software engineer working research, you end up learning like a very, very uh, wide range of things and you kind of feel useful for it. Um, so there was loads of stuff I could have talked about. This was a bit kind of um, scattershot, <laughs> um, but I'll thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, you can either email me uh, Owain oh, Jones at noc.ac.uk, or if you have any questions about like the C2 app uh, and what we do as a group, you can contact c2 at knock.ac.uk. So, yeah, thank you. So, uh, well, yeah, I'll crack on right with the questions. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that one seems to have just hopped to the top. Uh, may maybe we'll do that if we have a bit of time after the other serious questions. Um, so we'll go, we'll go with the one below it. Uh, how do you make emergency yeah. patches and make unexpected changes whilst you're out at sea? So, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, the last two times we've used our system out at sea, it's been on trials, luckily. So we've sort of been doing a big equipment trial, um, 
with our system as sort of testing out the auto subs. Um, so I was just, I was on board for both of these. So um, we sort of set up our development environment. We, we took what we had on land and then we set it up again on the ship. So, you know, sort of local GitLab, all the, all the stuff to build Docker images, things like that. And then just followed the same process that we did on land, but offline on the ship, I, you know, sort of, I was opening issues and making merge requests for myself. Um, and it was quite fraught. <laughs> um, sort of, it was a rushed few, rushed few days at the start of each trip. But yeah, that was one way. And then um, when my colleague was um, going to Antarctica, and I was sort of discovering bugs that would, um, you know, cause troubles on his sort of online coffee. Uh, we managed to fall back to sending Git diffs over email, which actually worked. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Coming up next, you say you learned early to adopt Agile. Did you adopt all parts verbatim or did you find any adaptations that helped your team specifically? We have gone through lots of loops um, trying to figure out like what kind of shape of Agile we want. Um, we kind of settled on on a version of Scrum that works for us. We went to like sort of official Scrum training at one point and then decided like it, it you know, it wasn't for like us. Um, so yes, we have sort of adopted what works for us and that is prone to change. And I think it will continue to change as we add more people. Um, but what we're doing now is like we have a sprint schedule of two weeks and at the end of each of those two weeks, we have the retrospective and that's a good place for us to sort of figure out if our process is working and what we can do better for the next two weeks. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, great. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, let's see how we're doing. Yeah. Okay. For time, how much... Have you changed the tech stack during your eight years of ad hoc learning? Okay, so there's some things that have been there since I started writing the original code before C2. Um, and there's stuff that is very much brand new. So we have changed tech stack a lot. Um, we've kind of stuck with things like Docker and Kubernetes, but the sort of um, things like authentication, you know, before we realized we had to go completely offline with this thing where we we're using like auth zero and then we switched to key clip. Um, yeah, we've changed it a lot. Um, we had the microservices pattern. So when it came to switching things out, um, that was, it was still a big thing to do, but it wasn't too difficult because it's just kind of like ripping out one thing and replacing it with another functional component. Yeah. Yeah. Nice lessons there. Right, I think we probably have time for about one more. Don't want to keep you too long from lunch. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, right. Really exciting work, agreed. How do you test your systems? Okay, I think maybe this was partially answered, but maybe I'll just get you to, to maybe reiterate that. How do you test your systems before you go out on your expeditions? With difficulty. Uh, <laughs> um, so we, we kind of do like hardware in the loop testing as much as we can. We have sort of bench systems and lab systems and we, we plug into the physical hardware. Um, but that can also be quite time constrained. Um, so it's like, oh, right, okay, we're, we're getting ready to go to see. We've got like two weeks in which to test this. And there's sort of these two days in which someone can come into the lab and physically do it. Um, and we, we do what we can with unit tests and stuff, but we've kind of realized that because there's so much we don't understand about a the systems that we're developing and b the the ocean um it's quite easy to miss lots and lots of edge cases um so i think the focus is kind of on mitigating problems making sure there's always fallbacks for things if if our test you know our test didn't capture something that will break um and just being able to like quite quickly fix stuff yeah okay thank you